Okay, um, looks like uh, all the panelists are in for the, um, uh, for the uh, upcoming panel. So I think we can get started. Um, uh, so today we are hosting the anchor session of the social innovation track. Um, it's called Open Spaces for Innovation. And we've gathered together people who are leaders in their field to come and tell us uh, how do they think of a new normal if no constraints existed if they had the carte blanche to define what their thematic area would look like. Um, I, I feel it would be a very interesting conversation to hear um, where the trends in the social sector in the thematic areas, in different thematic areas would be. Uh, I will start by introducing the moderator, Urvashi Devidyal. Uh, and then she in turn will talk about um, uh, the amazing panel that we have uh, gathered here. Um, so Urvashi um, uh, is the India lead at Sankalp Forum. Uh, she'll be moderating this event. Um, she's wor worked across the development sector in the US, UK, India, and on a lot of different sectors ranging from climate change to human trafficking. So we thought she's the, just the right person to bring together people from various sectors and have a conversation about where do they think that the new normal will be. So I will let Urvashi uh, uh, set some context about the, um, about the panel and introduce the panelists. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank you, Priya, for the introduction. And uh, a big thank you to the Nudge Foundation for organizing Charcha. Uh, I think if uh, this is definitely one of the most immediate examples of innovation to reach such a wide audience. And uh, we must congratulate this phenomenal effort. Uh, two weeks in to put this together is definitely game changing. Uh, you know, as, as Priya mentioned, I've been in the sector for a while and developmental challenges cannot be addressed in a siloed approach. And I really hope that this collaborative effort can lead to collective action. Um, just to start off, I'd like to welcome all of the panelists and all of the audience that is participating. I hope everyone is safe and staying healthy during these challenging times. Uh, the one thing that I did want to say is that, and I try and say this every day is that this is a moment of gratitude for all of us, that we have the privilege to be in our homes with access to technology. There are millions across the world who do not share the same privilege and this is really we, where we need the innovation required to reach the last mile. To set some context for this session, we wanted to understand what are the large open spaces for innovation? What are the new ways of learning? What are the new ways of accessing health services? the new ways of interacting with each other. This new normal also creates spaces for new ideas, new ways of working, and most importantly, tackling old problems. So where are the opportunities? Are there opportunities in education, healthcare, livelihood? Can this crisis drive a new wave of models that are more efficient and effective? How can we build products and services that break down the, both the digital and the physical divide? Um, we have an absolutely our panel of experts today uh, who have been on the forefront of all of these sectors. And we can hope to, and we really hope that we can get some insight into these big questions. Uh, many of them have already integrated technology into their models and the current crisis has accelerated the adoption of these models. Just to set some, uh, uh, talk about this, how this panel will go on. We have set aside about 50 minutes to hear from the panelists. And then we have another 40 minutes for questions and answers. So as Priya mentioned earlier, please do share your question, questions in the chat box. Uh, a great tip from Dr. Sunil Anand was that uh, if you can tell us who, which speaker wants to, that you want to address the question, that would be really helpful. Um, and also please do participate in the polls as they come up. We may not be able to see our audience, but hopefully we can at least try to understand our audience through your responses. Uh, I know Priya mentioned that I, could, I was gonna uh, read out some of the bios, but uh, I actually just really want to hear from the panelists. I think uh, in the briefs and catching up with them earlier, there is so much knowledge and there is so much to learn from them. Uh, so please do use the app, the Tendify app, and I think everyone's bio is up there. 
um, if you read it, you will definitely be as awed in awe as I am. So I would like to begin with Dr. Sunil Anand, CEO of Echo India. Echo India has been on the forefront of using technology platforms to get equitable healthcare to the masses. In fact, Echo has been using Zoom calls way before COVID made them the norm for us. Uh, can we, Dr. Anand, if you can share some of your model with us and also share a little bit about how the COVID-19 crisis has changed our model, that would be great. Thank you for inviting me for this talk and uh, good evening everyone and thank you to the audience for taking time out to learn about Project Echo. So what I'll do is I'll give a small brief of what Project Echo is, then I'll give you a brief of what I think the platform that we're using will innovate and build as we go along. And third is how Echo really evolved and responded to the COVID crisis. And I think I should finish in 10 minutes. So now, just to introduce Project Echo. Project Echo is actually a digital platform that works at scale to bring equitable health care and education to the underserved areas in India, rural areas, as well as what we call as the last mile. It's actually an amplifying tool and an implementation tool that works on a hub and spoke model. The hub, as we call it, is an academic institution where the experts would lie and spokes are where the learners would be. So then you have a conversation between the hub and spokes so that they can together come up with best practices and solve. Currently around the world, we have multiple hubs in 39 countries and spokes as learners in over 140 countries. We are really all over the world today. In India, we have got 34 active partners, all doing very major and multiple programs. Some of them are academic institutions, you call PGI Chandigarh, All India Institute, New Delhi, ICMR, Tata Memorial Hospital. All these are actually working towards building capacity. Mental health is tackled differently by NIMANS, where they are actually building capacity to put a counselor in every district of the country through the digital academy. That's the scale at which it will work. Many state uh, national health missions have adopted ECHO to train their health uh, force and get health care right down to the primary health care level. But what's very important and given ECHO a big boost is a partnership with the Ministry of Health. Today, ECHO is the platform of choice for TB elimination, all national programs, I would say, TB elimination, viral hepatitis control program, cancer screening across the country, treatment through the NCG or National Cancer Green Tartar Memorial, and above all, to build capacity in the public health care system, which includes 1,53,000 health and wellness centers under the Ayushman Bharat program. Now, that's how ECHO really works. So what is it that makes ECHO so special or different from others? I'll take a quote from Benjamin Franklin who said, tell me and I'll forget, teach me and I'll remember, but involve me and I will learn, and unquote. Now, what ECHO really does is it does not give knowledge out. Knowledge is available, you can, anybody can give it. What ECHO really does is brings communities together, collaboratively we learn, and then we build the best practices which is then shared across. I'll give you small examples to exemplify this. If you look at the state of Punjab, Punjab has the highest rate of hepatitis C because of drug abuse. The figures were as follows in 2016 end that we came in. Six lakh patients needed to be treated, 25,000 new entrants with hepatitis C, and PGI Chandigarh was the only state university treating them, and they were treating only 1,200 to 1,500 of them. There's no way this battle can be won. With collaboration with the government of Punjab, who gave 100 crores a year for free treatment, PGI Chandigarh came up with what's called a decentralized program that said they need to decentralize, have more and more doctors to treat because PGI cannot increase capacity. Even if you increase it tenfold, which you can't, but let's say you tenfold, 15,000, you reach not in the new joining list. So we connected 22 district hospitals, government district hospitals, and the three government medical colleges use their existing infrastructure with no extra cost to them. And in three years, the figures are as follows. 80,000 plus new patients have been treated at district hospitals. And the publication by PGI Chandigarh in the Journal of Hepatology says that the cure rate at both the places, PGI and the district hospital is exactly the same at 92%. Now, that's a treatment protocol. Now let's look at the actual, you know, uh, let's say screening. 
you cannot screen in major hospitals. How are you going to do it? This village to go to all India Institute of Home City, you got to take to them. The only way to take it to them is build capacity at the periphery. So cancer screening, what ECHO did was, we went and asked a question. Can the frontline health workers, the ASHA workers, the ANMs, and the doctors in the primary health center be trained to do ECHO? We did a face-to-face -face training for three days, did a pre-test, did an ECHO clinic hand-holding on the cases that they did over about 12,000 patients for oral breast and cervical cancer, did a study at the end of 12 months, and then 18 months later, we did another study and showed that not to forget the decelerating uh, curve for learning, at the end of 18 months, the knowledge of the uh, frontline workers increased by 5%. Why? Because they learned it by doing. Now look at the other example, mental health. It's a different subject altogether. I'm just trying to give you know, different examples. Mental health, you have to talk to patients. You don't have that much luxury of two minutes of patient. Chhattisgarh state was treating no patients on their own. They would get an all India doctor to come and train them and then go away. So Nimans mentored Chhattisgarh and in two and a half years, 60,000 new patients treated by doctors in Chhattisgarh, 1,30,000 plus OPD visits, and is increasing more and more. Is the code really only for this? Like I said, it's all about conversations and implementing your problems. Here's an example of how the systemic change or looking after something other than treatment alone can solve a problem. All of us know TB is a big problem in this country, but multi-drug resistant TB is very difficult to treat and there's a mortality of 50%. Now, so we've got 1,40 some plus thousand patients of MDR TB being treated in 147 centers. So we did an echo clinic for two years. 3,000 patients had to be put on a new drug for trial. We taught them everything. But at the end of the two years, the government realized that only 287 people were on the drug. So we held a clinic for these 147, broke them into five groups and discussed, oh, why are you not using it? Some came up and said, sir, the new drug causes cardiac toxicity. Now, I don't have an ECG machine. Why should I want to use it? Risk a patient's life. So we got some authority to sit in the clinic and ECG machines reached, paper reached them. And the second question, what they said, between the normal limits of an ECG, I will know a lot go into detail. When do I panic? When don't I panic? That was explained to them. And this started in August, 2018 with 287 patients, by in the June TB report of the government, the number of patients on bedaculant went up to 3,000, three times more, right, 300%. And then the beauty of it was at the end of December 2019, the figure is 9,055. That's how ECHO model can be done. Now, uh, my, my mentor, I would say, Sanjay Proit always keeps telling me, Sunil, don't scale that works, but work that, build something that works at scale. Echo is that tool that works at scale. And with that platform thinking, more and more networks are being formed. Huge amount of networks are formed. Why? When you want to learn on the platform or you want to discover on the platform, it encourages interactions. It brings value exchange. It distributes the ability to solve a problem. It doesn't tell you, here's this problem, go figure it out, here's a book to read. Nobody will give his uh, brother or sister a car to drive after telling them, if you read the manual, go right and take the key. You got to handhold them in an interactive way. It will inspire creations. It will build capacity. And above all, it will actually catalyze networks. Now, the beauty of ECHO is that currently, like I said, we have got so many networks running in India and around the world. So the advantage of this, uh, catal uh, catal uh, this uh, uh, network is that it will change the way we think. Typically, you'll have a flow. This is how the flow will go. This is how you will work. The platform thinking actually asks you to exchange ideas and turns teaching to learning. It's far better to learn than to be taught. Very few people, I don't want to listen to a lecture anymore. I really want an interaction between solve my problem. Don't tell me statistics, right? Remember, knowledge is available. Google has made it readily available to everybody. But how do I take that knowledge and turn it into implementable knowledge? That's what ECHO will really do. It'll solve your problem on live cases, the live problem that you have by interactive guest practice. So we don't disseminate best practices. We help you implement them. The network that ECHO forms is locally in the state, then in the country, around the world. 
I remember with 150 countries covering Ecuador, spokes joining in, we have built a huge network which allow which will allow us to share infrastructure, co create and discover. So the beauty of it all will be then it scales rapidly and sustainability. And towards the end, let me just say the COVID crisis ported something that none of us had ever seen. So ECHO not only had to scale rapidly, but had to repurpose itself to meet the challenge. And I'm proud to say that it worked at scale at population scale. And ECHO today, in the last 10 weeks, has supported over 650 sessions across the country and trained over 4 lakh frontline workers and doctors in various fields, including healthcare and a small part, I must admit, in water. And I'll end my talk with a little quote that I read from Margaret Mead, and she said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, is the only thing that ever has. And with that quote, I will thank everybody, and we open to question answers whenever you want. And I hope we can be of help and bring the platform to anybody that would like it. Remember, ECHO is not only an education arm in health, it's an education, water security, environment, policing, etc., etc. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, very grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Anand. Uh, I have uh, multiple follow-up uh, questions for you, but um, I think we'll, we'll sort of hear from all the panelists and come back to you. But thank you so much for sharing that. And I think that's a, that's a very hopeful moment to know that uh, healthcare advice and uh, there is uh, at the last mile, even in this crisis, you have reached so many different countries, not just across India. Um, I'd like to sort of move on uh, and bring in uh, Gayatri Vasudevan, CEO of Labor Net Services. Uh, Gayatri, as uh, Amit Chandra said this morning in the opening plenary, building livelihoods is going to be one of the most essential elements in rebuilding our economy. Um, LabourNet obviously has a vision to enable livelihoods and enhance quality of education through education, employability, and entrepreneurship. It has impacted about a million lives, empowering youth, men, and women to earn a decent living and become prof or become profitable micro-entrepreneurs. Um, it would be great if you can just explain a little bit more about what you have been currently doing and uh, how the COVID crisis has changed your model or maybe accelerated your model a little bit more. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Urvashi. And uh, I think, thank you, uh, Priya. Like Urvashi said, uh, um, you know, thank you for bringing us all into this, uh, this drawing room for us to all have this uh, charcha. Um, Labanet, uh, we started with the vision of uh, uh, what we call enabling livelihood. And I think it's a full circle that the COVID uh, crisis has brought us. Uh, when we started it, we thought work to workers was our motto. Uh, so we said, uh, what prevents uh, workers to get work is information. Um, you should know, have networks. You should know where, inf where work is going to be available. And this particularly is true in a country where uh, a majority are informal sector workers. You know, there are various figures floating around, whether it's 80% or 90%. How many are in agriculture is 45% and non-agriculture has become formalized. So I'm not going to go into a number debate, but anything over 50% is significant to uh, for us to handle. And we're talking of a range of 50 to 80%. So our first problem was, how do you get information to uh, a person so that the person is able to decide both employer, uh, person who gives work, and the person who takes work. The second is that what determines, uh, um, uh, what makes you decide to take a person for work, right? Um, and the reason I'm using work as opposed to jobs is that jobs has a, a connotation of security. You know, you get a monthly salary, you get a PF, you get an ESI, even if it is low paid, you get that. So there's a connotation of formality in it, whereas uh, in work, there is no formality in it. So the task is performed and you get it. Uh, in today's world, it would be called gig, but uh, there's a lot of work which is happening outside uh, the gig, you know, which is your traditional uh, self-employed because you don't have an option and you're, you're paid on work. Now here, your the way you would uh, 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 give work is based on uh, an assumption of uh, uh, what you call experience. So, uh, for example, if you were to cut your hair, 
you'd want to go with somebody who uh, uh, you know who knows how to cut your hair you wouldn't want to give your head to just anybody uh, um, uh, you have an electrician you want somebody who's experienced uh, you want uh, someone who drives your car and i could go on whether it's rural or urban the the continuum here is, is very minimal but so this is what we set out to do we said that you need to have standards you need to certify people and uh, work has to be given to work so therefore we looked at the whole continuum of uh, what it means to have a platform um, uh, and i use platform a little loosely here not necessarily only as a technology platform but as a as a network of people who are able to exchange information on work and are able to come and get certified and get recertified because people do learn modularly um, and this is particularly true in the uh, uh, in the uh, uh, if i may use a class statement lower echelons of vocations you know so uh, unlike uh, it's true for everybody that you need to be consistently learning but it is more true at the at the lower uh, level so um, um, uh, that's what we set out to do and i'm i'm now i'm going to sort of park what labornet does and go on to discuss really um, what covid uh, will mean for this for this group of people you know i think i'd want to focus there traditionally uh, if you look at learning uh, uh, the poor have been uh, uh, have really been the door has been closed on them in multiple ways you know access has been given quality is not there um, when access is given particularly where you have to learn skills uh, it has been uh, mimicking education so it's been trying to bring people into classrooms it's been trying to standardize those uh, classrooms because who pays for it is different unlike in private education where uh, uh, i as a parent pay for my child and i'm interested in the future of my child and i hope for the bright bright future of my child in vocational education it's different it is either the sarkar as the mai baap who pay, pays or a philanthropic uh, um uh, you know either csr or is an individual you pay so when someone else pays for you your your expectation is gratitude and your expectation from the individual is gratitude the learner from the um, uh from the uh, uh uh institution which gives it is compliance uh these are the two which happens right because it, there's no interest out there so um uh, while covid is the most unfortunate situation in the world my hope is covid is going to transform this completely um you know uh we've had in formal education smart classes come in um now in vocational education and i think uh, the what i'm going to say is a segue to what uh, dr sunil lanan said is uh, imagine a hybrid uh, vocational education that means anybody can access vocational education in any manner uh, so we can have virtual classrooms we can have asynchronous for practicals uh, imagine an oyo you see you are aggregating workspaces where you can do practical and i go back to my first point right what do you what do you like in a person or what, what do you esteem in a person who's going to come and do your for you experience experience and experience so the more you can give experience and you are able to quantify that experience and give ratings around it this is going to change that means vocational education or skill training as you call it has to now evolve completely and this could be the golden moment where we don't have a choice but to evolve right you cannot put 30 students in a class anymore uh, which means that your entire way of thinking has to now change now i'm going to go to my other continuum that we're discussing right work we're all everybody is in in shock at this moment we don't know how are we going to how how is work going to happen you're going to have uh, cities uh, uh, which are going to be hungry for workers right they they're going to say where are the people there because at least temporarily people are going to go back and suddenly we're all going to realize we don't have them i mean and let's look at everyday life right uh, and i hear i just i'm just stating the, the way uh, when you walk on a road what do you see you're going to see a security guard who's mostly from assam you're going to see a plumber from odisha you're going to see uh, um uh, you know the uh, the entire uh, migrant population which has uh, you know um, 
I, I think scorched the nation at this point of time who are going from Bihar, UP, Jharkhand, walking back to uh, West Bengal, Odisha. Uh, uh, this group of people are going back. They've always had uh, migration patterns, but this time they're going back hurt. They're going back hurt because we didn't treat them well. All of us are in red zones. All of us sitting here on our computers are in red zones. Uh, they're all in the green zones, which they're going back to. Um, uh, just, just because we didn't uh, realize their skill sets and we couldn't really quantify who they were. We, we didn't understand the need there. Now we're going to have a situation where all those places where work is not available is worker surplus. That means the skilled labor is back home. And you have the, uh, and you have the cities uh, with people like us, uh, uh, as well as uh, probably first generation or second, sorry, second generation or third generation migrants who still are there in the cities who are going to become important. So my hope is the following, right? Um, we, we need to now reimagine the way in which work is going to be done, which means that occupational safety health, uh, 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 was something which was at the back of a compliance uh, amongst uh, a list of probably hundreds of compliance elements in a manufacturing factory and, and a little bit in other areas. But we never thought of it as an integrated thing with work conditions and living conditions. So you have enormous scope for us to rethink design. Design at rural, design at urban. Uh, and, it's, and this design... Uh, uh, needs to be uh, cognizant of the changes that the society has asked of us, right? Uh, it has forced us to think, saying that uh, the continuum between technology, learning, and work has to be bridged. And when we bridge it, we are going to look at the, the tensions between these various things. That means that uh, in an urban area, uh, I need to now decongest. Um, uh, what does decongesting mean, right? I'm, I may have about 35 to 50 cities which have population more than a million. Um, uh, sorry, uh, more than uh, a million, yes. And then I may have 7,000 or so uh, urban spaces where I have 50,000 to a lakh population. Should we actually develop the 7,000 so that I don't congest it in the 35? It gives us space to think. Uh, it gives us space to think of learning. As I said, my hope for vocational education is it's going to be transformative uh, if we put, put our minds together uh, and don't think small, don't think center, don't think space, but think the world is your learning space. I think that's the, that's the ask for all of all of us today, which, uh, um, uh, which I think uh, the way will be shown by the poor. Uh, you know, they will this time uh, take the destiny and it's for us to be the supporting, enabling framework for us to get it there. I think that's that's really the uh, the space. Uh, and I think the the session says um, space, open spaces for innovation. And I was thinking, uh, if I was to summarize, uh, open space for innovation, hybrid uh, vocational education, open space for innovation, uh, worker surplus areas. How do I actually uh, have networks created there quickly? to ensure quick work is given and in worker deficit areas like in red zones that we live in how do how does how do you actually augment and reskill to relaunch the city with a new contour uh, so let me stop there again thank you so much for the opportunity of course thank you so much gayatri for that uh, that was uh, incredibly uh, incredibly moving to explain a little bit beyond what the migrant labors is is going through and I think you know the the conversation that we are hearing on the television has been focused in one area but uh, this is really where where we need to start thinking very quickly on um, and uh, you there's a whole bunch of questions that are coming in for you uh, but I'll just uh, move on a little bit to the next panelist and uh, I think I'd like to bring in Dr. Lalitesh Katragara now um, Definitely technology innovation is really at the core of your work and you've been the pioneer in crowdsourcing and building products for the underserved. Uh, so it would be great to hear a little bit more about what you're doing and uh, if you could sort of spend just a, little, a few minutes on uh, how the COVID crisis has changed the current work that you're working on. That'd be great. Thank you. 
and thank you priya for inviting me um i think it's uh, i'll i'll start with by saying that you know i don't have any answers right um i when, whenever we talk about development uh, i keep i'm reminded continuously reminded of uh, gandhi ji's words that what we say here makes no difference to the people that we are trying to serve um the i'll make a few observations and uh, i think if i if i can spend 5 minutes i'll spend 5 minutes defining the problem and um and there is a, i don't know the solution but there are outlines of what can be done so we have we are giving birth to an australia every year we are 25 million people are born every year in this country and 25 million people come into the job market every country every year and uh, we are creating less than a million jobs best case all right so this country is not a country that's going to be uh, fed or um, livelihood is not going to be created by jobs right? that's very clear and uh, as far as uh, you know um, critical areas of development are concerned everything from law and order to property rights um, and so on the the structures themselves are broken so i'll give you one example um the average farmer in india has uh, 1.4 hectares of land um and uh, most of them have one hectare which is acre and a half and so on but at the same time even though they have an acre or more and most of those acres are worth 8 to 10 lakhs right but we struggle we have a financial system that struggles to give them less than 50000 rupees of a loan right this is not true in any developed country in the world where people cannot get you know even 20 30% of the value of the asset they have and the reason is that the <laughs> this is from akbar's days um we still have a jagir system that is silently in place we do not have property rights our people do not own the land every person in india is a squatter um we have a document that says registration document all it means is you are you have registered from somebody the state has yet to confer absolute property rights to people right and i'm saying everybody from small business to large business the railways has for example the indian railways <laughs> the largest land holder in india is sitting on top of a trillion dollars worth of land and they cannot get a few billion dollars loans when they want to right this is a this is an endemic problem i'm not saying this is a poor versus rich um and then the other problem we have which was i think highlighted um, by the previous speakers is we have an education system that even even if the education system worked perfectly right it doesn't right i went to one of the better public schools in india kendriya vidyalaya and came out fine but even if everybody got educated in kendriya vidyalaya or the better versions of kendriya vidyalaya right we would have a set of graduates who would not know what to do with their education right much better than what we have right now but they would not know what to do with their education because we are heading um you know we are hurtling into the automation era right and uh, it is not something we can put our hand head in the sand about we can delay it by one or two years but not much longer and when the automation era is completely here almost every job we now call a job will be automated and if we don't i mean we are we are between the devil and the deep sea because of our economy we are dependent heavily on imports from energy to other things right so we cannot be isolated and if you isolate ourselves what happened in 1990 will happen again and uh, if we don't isolate ourselves we have to compete with the rest of the world if you have to compete with the rest of the world you have to let automation happen right if you let automation happen and be competitive with the rest of the world our jobs even the existing jobs will getting uh, will get uh, vaporized the world bank uh, did a study with the brookings institute uh, saying that 67% of our jobs are under threat um and one of my colleagues who is the head of ai and robotics in uh, the ai and robotics road map in the us he says that uh, you know 67% is an underball more like 90% are under threat right and this will take two or three decades to play out but you are seeing the effects of that the first effect of that is you know wages start lowering or stagnating because you know any time the wages try to increase automation gets replaced with that and so i'm i'm painting a very bleak picture and that's for a reason uh, that if we don't understand this bleak picture i think we are in trouble right because any solution we create is not going to work and it's not going to have an impact um now 
what are the what are the outlines of the solution um, and the outlines of the solution do begin with the people the answer lies with the people um, the answer lies in the resources they already have um, and the wherewithal they have and there are two data points i will start with the very same uh, agricultural community which is kind of you know in when economists talk about indian economy they don't really they kind of pay lip service to agriculture but they don't focus on it um, but in many ways that is one big part of the solution um, the reason why is uh, 65 or 50 plus percent of india still works in agri and allied and uh, they do have some farm holdings small or big and if you look at the productivity of farms in high density areas like south korea and israel and so on um, a farmer is able to generate 5 to 6 lakhs of income per acre and our farmers struggle to generate uh, 10 to 25000 rupees per acre so that gap um, and we believe the analysis that uh, we have done um, i'm talking when i say we it's a whole bunch of we it's indihood it's avanti this fintech that uh, nandan and ratan tata have started it is social alpha and it is uh, societal platforms or uh, many of the all of the usual suspects our analysis tells us that even in india we can increase farm inco income tenfold right per farmer if you do all the things right there's a whole bunch of things i won't go through that right now that's a separate conversation and if if that is possible then all our efforts need to be on that because in, unless we do a significant increase in livelihood of the people we are talking about the search for jobs will continue because nobody values the property that they already have and they are not able to monetize and a whole bunch of things need to be done dematerialization of land is one access to finance is one Coll and digital collectivization so people act as a collective um, is one and there are many other pieces to the solution but the emphasis has to be on that and the other area the other you know dark uh, uh, network that exists in india is our micro entrepreneurs so we have in urban india 40 million registered small and micro entrepreneurs rural india is estimated to have another 40 million um, if you take all the small stores and kirana stores and so on and so forth but there is another hidden force with, and this is india's strength in many ways we are the most entrepreneurial country on the planet even more than the us in a per per thousand people basis and uh, and the other 80 million so there is 80 million that are visible the 80 million that are invisible the other 80 million are all women right so these are women sitting at home <clears throat> both in urban and rural india and you know what i'm talking about there is no neighborhood in india where there are no women entrepreneurs sitting at home doing things and uh, they have been you know they have been kind of ignored right um, and this 160 million entrepreneurs both uh, visible and the invisible is i think uh, the way forward so if we do if we do things right if we empower them if we get friction out of the way they face enormous amounts of friction right um people have written articles about this and papers have been written about the 60000 regulations our entrepreneurs have to deal with right um in in if you if you take an advanced country like the us the typical entrepreneur has to deal with one page of regulations that they have to file every year and uh, if there is something that they don't know um it is taken care of by the payroll systems and so on so if we if we if we get rid of friction and we empower them and we let them loose um each of these entrepreneurs even half of them start succeeding and start generating employment and not a lot like five to six people each india will be employed right and uh, and you know there is this hierarchy i like to think about if you give people uh, fish they will eat if you teach them to fish you know they will eat for life but teaching you know 100 million people is very hard right um if you give an opportunity to them however they will teach themselves to fish right and uh, that's all we need to do we need to give these 80 million 160 million people opportunity now specifically um, i will not talk about what indihood and avanti are doing we are building various societal scale platforms one of the things not to do is when you are building platforms is don't do anything that does not scale right it's a discipline even if it feels convenient uh, like uh, sunil said recent i mean sunil just outlined right he has chosen not to do a lot of things i mean it's very it's it's kind of deceptively simple what sunil is doing is deceptively simple because it seems like a very simple collaborative platform where you can exchange information 
but that's what platforms look like. They look deceptively simple because he has done away with a lot of things he could have done, but he's not doing, right? So it's key to actually build platforms, imagining scale and imagining that, you know, if 500 million people want to use my platform, how can this be used um, and, do, and don't do anything that does not allow that to happen. And there are two things I think we need to demand. Um, one of them is the A word. I'm going to talk about Aadhaar, right? Um, I think we have thrown the baby out with the bathwater, right? Aadhaar has enormous potential to bring uh, equality um, and uh, level of service delivery to the entire population. Um, one of the travels I did to Orissa, this was following the footsteps of one of the people mentioned here, Sanjay, when he, Sanjay Anand, when he mentioned it, I went to Orissa and looked at it. There are tribal people in Orissa, believe it or not, they're having carbohydrate starvation. Now, in a country like India, this should not happen. And like, you know, thousands of families, not just a few. They should not, I mean, people should not be having kosher current car car carbohydrate starvation and the things that should not happen if rations were reaching them. At scale, rations are not reaching entire districts, right? And we have failed as civil society to demand that yes, privacy is important. Yes, you have to put in checks and balances, but make sure it is actually used to deliver services to people because that's the only way this happens. That's the only way we are going to solve the distribution problem at its population of our scale and our diversity and our complexity. And the other thing I think we need to demand is we have been at, we have been pregnant with broadband for almost a decade now as a country. And it has reached all of us. <laughs> I have been in, I, have, I came back to India in 2004 and this is now 2020. It was hard for me to get a megabit per second when I came and now you know, my kids are probably playing, uh, you know, videos right now in this house and I'm able to stream to you without trouble. I had like 200 megabits per second reaches my home, right? And it costs a few hundred rupees, right? But this, this ability does not exist in villages. The rural part of India is struggling. Um, and one of the reasons they struggle is they are unable to connect with us. And any solution you think through deeply will begin and end with them having access to information and them having to access to information at a degree where they are able to communicate visually like we are, right? That requires every person in the household to have 10 to 20 megabits per second. There is no way around having broadband, right? We have to deliver broadband per capita. Um, it will cost us 17 to $20 per capita to get fiber into every home in the country, right? Um, and pound for pound, this is the cheapest intervention we can do to develop the economy. Right. Any solution we talk about will only work if broadband reaches everybody. Right. And these are the two preconditions. If you solve these two preconditions, magic can happen. I'll just give you one example and then stop as to why broadband is so necessary. Right. Um, the wave of, you know, intervention that began with jam, you know, Jandhan, Aadhaar and mobile, right, um, has not really finished. And we are now celebrating, if you talk to people in India and outside India, everybody is celebrating that uh, UPI went from zero to being the fourth largest payment network in the world within three years or something, right? But the sad part is this is just with 100 million users. India is such a vast country. 100 million users can make that happen. Uh, but a billion people are not able to use UPI today. And I'm picking my words very carefully. I didn't say they, cannot, they are not using it. I'm saying they cannot use it. So they have bank accounts, but no debit cards. And without a debit card or an online account, you cannot use UPI. And UPI is meant for self-service. It's meant for to be used on your phone. Uh, it has to be a smartphone. It cannot be used on a, you know, it cannot be used using my neighbor's phone if they have a smartphone. So there are barriers we have created for ourselves and we need to demand that the, all the digital infrastructure that India has been really, you know, ahead, we are ahead by a generation compared to the rest of the world are creating, they really need to reach every nook and corner of the country. If they do, I believe, um, you know, like uh, uh, Gayatri and Sunil said, our people are very smart, right? If, if a family is able to actually make their life work with the 240 problems they have, they're smart enough to adopt technology and figure out what to do with it. If they don't figure out what to do with it, the thousands of entrepreneurs we have, one of them will stumble on the problem and that demand will explode and they will find solutions, right? So I'm not worried about that. We need to just make sure that we empower them with the basics and we have not done so. Um, and, the, and, the, and, and, and I will also stop with another example. Unlike the industrial era where the government had to create problems and 
make sure that sorry create solutions to large problems like energy and so on and make sure those things reached everywhere we are now in a technologies era where the the original thesis of swadeshi is possible where swaraj in a local level is possible what i mean by that is if you don't have electricity in a village and if you have access to capital right in the ways that we have discussed um you can set up a solar farm near your village and set up a few batteries and you're powered right you don't have to wait for a big thermal power station to be set up and electricity to, to reach you and on a per rupee basis that's actually cheaper right so we can go on and on but i'll stop there saying that uh, we are in an era where people are capable they can be empowered but we have to do the basics to empower them and the rest will follow excellent uh, thank you so much uh, dr katchagada for sort of setting the stage for that and uh, sharing some of the the, the vast uh, areas where innovation is really needed uh, i'm completely with you on land rights and uh, property rights i think uh, I, you know you didn't touch on legal but uh, <laughs> that would probably be the next uh, space that really could uh, change things um I, th there are a lot of follow up questions and there's obviously a lot of connect with what the rest of the other panelists are doing uh and you know i'm just going to spend some time bringing uh, rukmini banerji in uh but i would like uh, you know once once we sort of get that done that if you know even if the panelists have questions and want to sort of interact with each other please do sort of do that um so thank you and uh, i will now bring in uh, rukmini banerji who is the ceo of pratham Rukmini, thank you for your patience. And uh, I think uh, you know, in the morning, uh, Shri Rajiv Kumar from Niti Aayog had mentioned that uh, 64 percent of schools don't have electricity. Uh, I know all of us, at least that was his statistic. Uh, Zoom school, obviously, in the urban world, has become the norm. Uh, you know, it's it's probably not the reality on the ground. uh i know pratham has been doing fantastic work across the country for many many years and has really you know raised the standard of education and not just education but our understanding of what education really is it's not just the you know knowing what abc is um so could you please just sort of share some of the work that you're doing and you know how this covid crisis has really changed because i think for in, definitely within education in particular uh the, the concern is that we will sort of go back many many years from the learning so i'll let you get started then uh thank you so much uh, vishi one of the advantages even though we are called pratham coming at the end is that you get the advantage of hearing what uh, so many very very experienced people have to say um there was a comment in one of your chats ki thoda sa hindi mein bhi bolna chahiye should i do that or continue as we are doing no no uh, please go ahead I, uh, okay yeah continue. so yeah. <laughs> so i would say ki uh, in many ways uh, education you know hum log education mein kaam karte hain we work in two ways ek directly with communities and ek uh, in partnership with governments um we also do quite a bit of vocational skilling now but i think uh, gayatri has spent a uh, good time and you know laid out that landscape quite well um i love the way uh, uh, uh mr lakshmi narayan laid out the landscape and the lens and i think that uh, in in both ways you know um uh, what am i seeing what am i learning uh, yeah, how is the ground under me changing as i'm building the highway on it i think ye sab hamare life mein bahut high speed se ho raha hai abhi i mean it's amazing to me and i think everybody would agree ki ghar se bahar nahi nikal rahe hain but jis tezi se cheeze hamare charo taraf ho rahi hain उसके ऊपर कब्जा रखना बिकम रियली डिफिकल्टीन मार्च एंड जब ये कोविड क्राइसिस आया तो कोई हिल नहीं पाया हमारे लोग आर यूज टू गांव में जाना स्कूल में जाना बच्चों से मिलना एंड डूइंग वट एवर यू नो वर्क वी डू इन दैट वे एंड विद इन अ वीक और सो वी बिगैन टू हियर दैट यू नो वी आर कनेक्टेड टू ऑल ऑफ दीज पीपल एंड वी आर कनेक्टेड टू मोर प्लेसेस 
Now, in many ways, I feel, you know, we've been talking about giving opportunity. I think people are taking opportunity. People are finding opportunity. And what you need to do is to learn from how these things are happening to be able to. So we were in uh, connected to, let us say, 6,000 or 7,000 villages uh, in uh, March. And today, we are connected directly to more than 12,000 villages. And this has happened without anybody moving. How has it happened is the interesting question. And again, I feel that we have learned a lot. That the people who are on the ground, generally a pratham person who works directly on the ground, has five to ten villages almost daily basis. So the first reaction without any direction from anyone was exactly like how you do with your family. I think in the first week we were all busy calling everybody we knew to make sure that people were okay. And in that began the first set of anchors. And then uh, in each, if you think of a nested structure that you're in, you're in a village, then you're in a hamlet, then you're in a, we have children's groups, so you're in your group. And then there are children in the group. Some of the group, the children are from the same family. Some are from different neighborhood families. And, uh, you know, we've been tracking. The other day I was speaking to uh, my uh, colleagues, Uttarakhand. And I said, Ki, mujhe na, har mein tum log kaha, kaha tak batao. And it was literally like that. The first round, first week was, am I anchored into every village? Then am I anchored into every hamlet? Then, and I know the children by name. I know their parents by name, so if you have to connect with people with people, then what will be connect with them? What will happen? We have a digital uh, team within Pratham who had been creating digital content and in about a thousand villages, we operate. We were already operating only like that. But the digital content you can send, interesting activities, because we felt that in this time, connecting with people, making sure they're okay, and then engaging with children is really important. In fact, the campaign that we are running is called Corona, and obviously, Corona is a, there's a play on the word Corona, uh, which uh, you know has a positive connotation in many languages. Karo, <laughs> nah. um, and I think that what we discovered within the first ten days is that uh, smartphone connectivity, at least access for the children, is what come. You know, depending on which state you're in, which uh, block you're in, uh, maybe only forty percent or less can get to it. So very quickly, he phone hai, because my baat kar pa rahi hun, to agar phone hai, to wo basic phone hai. Basic phone hai, to mein SMS bhej sakti hun. And so a huge amount of activity quickly to say that I'm going to send you engaging activities uh, on uh, your phone. If you looked at the social network, ki hum bachyo se ke saath, we are sending messages and then somebody from Pratham is calling. Uh, hafte mein ek baar, paanch din mein ek baar to say, tum kaise ho, tum ko jo activity aai, wo kaisi thi, and so on and so forth. We found that you are sending the message to the children on one number, but they are replying back from different numbers at different times. There is a whole social network associated with communication. And I think it's when somebody wants to communicate with you, they feel connected as human beings. And I'm sure Dr. Anand, you must be seeing the same thing, that the technology is an enabler, but there are human beings on both sides. And when the human beings main purpose is to connect, they will find ways and means to do so. So we find that as their parents began to understand that these are little bits of activities which are coming, and in many cases, there are things which uh, can be Then they began to make sure that children have access uh, to these things. So I think that, you know, I mean, this to us is that we had not thought that you can go, nothing was stopping us from doing all this before. There was no reason you could not have had a virtual meeting like this you know, six months ago, but we didn't do it. Now, what we will be doing many more such things in the future because, you know, we have made a lot of but as we are being majboor, we are thinking that we will do Rukmini, I think your screen... I think uh, Rukini's screen has frozen a bit. I think a broadband is gone. I think a place would be. Yeah. Case for Lalitesh's point. <laughs> uh, Rukmini, maybe if you can try and put your video off. 
uh, we'd still love to hear the rest of what you're saying. Maybe we can ping her. Okay, I will message. Yeah. Excellent. Um, let's just give that a minute to see if we can actually get her back on because I know she was really in the middle of the point that she was trying to make and sharing some of the work that is there. But, uh, you know, obviously very interesting to see where education will go after this. And I think uh, just the speed with which I think both Dr. Anand, you talked about your work in terms of reaching you know, many more people and reaching many more health workers and, you know, spreading information because of COVID. And Gayatri, you mentioned that too, and uh, so did Rukmini. Um, I think this this is really that uh, that pivot that is needed or that push that is needed from all of us. Rukmini comes, because I guess I'm yes. in a fairly similar, of course, we don't need Please. school education. Please. So I think the point she was making is it's happened even to us, right? We yeah. Uh, by March 29th, we went uh, through a combination of virtual and uh, uh, asynchronous uh, modality. Uh, okay. So I think Rukmini is back. Um, but uh, uh, the, the point I was making is uh, the way we do it is that uh, children started coming on to the platform. So Rukmini, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. I was just trying to fill the blank. <laughs> uh, uh, explain the process a bit. Uh, so let me stop, Rukmini. As... Uh... Lalitesh said how he has superb connectivity in his house. I was thinking, unfortunately, my house is not like that. And lo and behold, here I am uh, disconnected. Um, just, I mean, I, I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I do think that uh, on the one hand, uh, it is amazing that we've been able to connect uh, in a, in a, uh, uh, to our children. The second thing is that, uh, you know, who is part of the connection? is also very interesting. You know, if you think about a picture of education that is in everyone's mind, a school hai, a building hai, usme kuch log hai, teacher hai, bachche aate hai, ghanti bachti hai, bachche padhai karte hai, and then you go home. Uh, and I think in many ways that picture is now frozen uh, and hopefully will, uh, when it unfreezes, it will be totally different. In the meanwhile, all kinds of people have come into this line in middle class households with Zoom, there is parents who are, you know, fussing around the children, making sure that, you know, Zoom ka homework aap kar rahe ho. But in a large part of what we are seeing is that depending on the input that is going, if the activities that we are asking children to do uh, is at the right level, then a lot of parents get involved as well. And so this has been an opportunity for us to see ki kaun se level pe log engage hote hain. We sent a little SMS message the other day, which said ki, so many, many videos, photographs and phone calls came back with all these questions, including parents calling to say, we use but you you know. So I think that this has given us a huge lens into the fact that many, many people can be involved if the engagement is on a platform that welcomes this. Our traditional schools keep parents out, government schools, other schools keep parents out. The entire system is governed by the holy grail of the curriculum. The curriculum has been set by somebody somewhere far away. It is highly academic. And uh, the other day, a journalist called me and said, Ki, you know, now schools are closed, so bacho ki learning to band ho gayi. So I said, actually, schools are closed. The bachoki learning actually chalu ho gayi. <laughs> the children are learning a lot. And we, when we schools reopen, we have to spend a lot of time to figure out ki why did the, the, you know, what did the children learn? My granddaughter was over today and I said to her, Uska bhi ye zoom shum chal hai. So I said, you like this? She said, nahi, mere ko nahi achha lagta because is na se teacher se baat ho nahi hoti hai. Main apne friend se baat nahi kar sakti hai. A big reason why we go to school is many other things other than academic. A big things about what we learn about life come from lots of interaction. And so in many ways, I think learning is being highly accelerated in a very organic way and at every level. I mean, those kids who are walking back with their parents are learning the, you know, maybe the hard way, a hell of a lot of things that they wouldn't have if they had been, uh, you know, staying somewhere. So my overall view is that the what of education has changed. Now, the, the, uh, the, the how 
is, you know, it's very different, somewhat looks disorganized. The who has many more characters in it. The when, kab on hoga, kab off hoga, kab bits mein hoga, kab continuously hoga, all this will change. And that as uh, interested people at every level, I think we have to work very hard to say that when this picture unfreezes, it should not go back to that old school. We should not be in a big hurry to say, yeah, six months of school was made, so we accelerate and do the same curriculum that I had to do in the year. I think we have to take this moment, to take a deep breath and say that we have come to freedom. Now we can reimagine things. We also have a Rakshas now. The Rakshas is called COVID. You can blame all bad things on the Rakshas. Earlier, you couldn't have, you don't have anybody to blame. You know, you can blame society, poverty, vagara, vagara. Now we all have a common Rakshas. Rakshas ka fayda uthao. Usko blame karo. And imagine a different part where parents are central, where we can actually allow children to be welcomed into school, give them the time to have the fun that we all know can be had. Uh, my own feeling is that give pre-2020, whenever the school year starts, is a totally different year. And give the space for everybody to settle down. I think the school has the potential today, whether a good, you know, high fi school or a government school, to be the center of the community of families that it serves, welcome the families in. And I think that this learning for life has proven to be as important as the learning for, you know, for the uh, whatever uh, uh, school or so on. Uh, I don't want to spend any more time because I'm sure there'll be discussion on how young people will fit into all of this. I have some uh, lots of thoughts on this. I just want to finish by saying if there is any policy maker sunning, uh, it's not sunning, sorry, listening. <laughs> Mr. Rajiv Kumar, if he's listening, ki narega me allow kardo ki log bacho ko padhai. That will give a lot of meaning and a lot of relevance to many people who will have time. And that if some little tweaks like this are allowed, it will allow a proper engagement into this very important process of how do we bring up our children in a way that they can cope with a world which may be like this in the future. So I'll stop there and uh, hopefully we'll have, uh, you know, we'll come back to some of them. Thank you so much, Rukmani, for that. Uh, and uh, I think this is really where uh, we need to collectively make sure that all of these ideas and all of these thoughts of where the interventions need to happen need to be sent to the government uh, in a very systematic way. And I think, uh, you know, the government is listening and this is, uh, we are the voice of the development partners, as we've been told. Um, but, uh, you know, I think we're just going to run a poll again, right? Priya, is that right? Yes, we'll run one quick poll just to understand what thematic area people are interested in and focusing on. Okay, excellent. Um, we should see the poll on your screens. Would uh, be great if you can let us know. Okay, I think we we can't vote for it. Um, but uh, you know, thank you for all of you, all of the panelists, to sort of set the stage for a really interesting discussion that will go on. Uh, there's so many different points that we have to follow up with, and there is uh, a fair bit of questions that have been coming in from the audience also. Uh, but you know, I think one of the things that, and I'll throw this out to anyone who wants to answer this, is that there is uh, definitely the space for technology, but there is also a very, um, a very uh, underlying aspect that the community plays a very strong role in all of this, right? Uh, and if anybody has any sort of views on where where that behavior change or where that needs to sort of interplay with this, because technology in itself cannot be the answer. Um, so, if, any interesting examples? That would be great to sort of hear this. Uh let me take a stab at it. Um, sure. So I think uh, um, I, I think it's the it's uh, two elements there. Right? Uh, technology is today accessible, and at the same time, uh, we we have defined how it has to be accessed. Uh, uh, accessed. Um, I think that uh, we need to re relook at a bit. Um, you know, telecallers were always. Uh, were things that were people who were serving uh, uh, quote unquote businesses. Uh, now you probably need to adapt it to rural areas, you know, into 
uh, borrowing from Rukmini's uh, example on education, uh, we are doing it with their vocational education. So you probably need a lot of facilitators uh, for the same role, a different thing. Similarly, now, uh, you know, we all know that some centers are not languages. Uh, can we have uh, uh, telemedicine operators who are these unemployed who have gone back? Um, you know, so we need to really look at uh, people and jobs uh, in, a, in a new sense. Uh, we, we, uh, we need to change our way of thinking technology can be accessed only in a particular manner. Uh, I think we made the mistake once uh, uh, and it stayed uh, with us for a very long time where we made everybody do the same things. What you and I do in the drawing room was what we thought was right, whereas 80% wasn't doing it. So how do you give uh, a voice to what they're doing and then have technology support it? I think would be a better way of looking at it rather than the reverse, you know. Now today it's, it's the reverse which actually determines. So we don't really listen to the voices on the ground for us to design our systems in a manner in which it democratizes it for them. I think uh, I would like to think of technology as a, as a chamach. So the chamach, uh, uh, you know, I could use it for cooking, I could use it for eating, but it's my definition of how I want to use it. So, uh, I, um, so you know, let the chamach not decide uh, I need to only use it in a particular manner is, uh, is what I would say. Urushi, you're muted. I, I was just going to say, Rukmini, would you like to come in out there? Yeah, I, I think that this is also a moment. I mean, you are asking about community, but I think they say there is also uh, this is the right moment for decentralization. I mean, if I give the example of uh, schools opening, it is going to be a local decision because there will be, you know, your red, green or orange or whatever criteria you use. Some areas are going to be more ready soon. Some areas are going to be more ready uh, later. Beach, beach may halat badlenge. You will have to take your decisions then. And I think it's decentralization ka fayda uthana chahiye. I, uh, I myself, I'm from Bihar, and I remember uh, spending some time with a cluster. A cluster is about 15 schools uh, in uh, uh, Rotas district. And uh, in within the education system, you have somebody called a cluster coordinator. And uh, you know there are 15 schools, and I remember asking this gentleman, "Ki apko kya lagta hai school ko sudharne ke liye kya karna padega?" And he laughed and he said to me, "Do you really want to know what I say? Ki upar se chitti aayi." Because uh, hume ideas hain ki how do we take the resources that we have here? And of course, everything needs to improve. Dunya mein bahut sare aur chizo ki zarurat hai. But even right now, out of the 12 schools, four are quite good, two are very bad, three are in the middle. I have 35 teachers, but I don't have the power to reorganize this in a way that makes sense locally. Because chitti upar se aati hai. So I think we have to use this moment also to say that because of the halat, decisions need to be taken at a level which is very close to the um, point of action. And uske liye, let people, you know, have faith. I mean, we've come a long way with actually trusting each other. And uh, actually, in times of hardship, people, uh, better things come out in people than otherwise. And so how do we use this to decentralize? Why not move some uh, resources to the panchayat? Let them decide ki food security kaise honi chahiye, and other things. So it's a moment for really pushing for local level decision making in a collective. It doesn't have to happen, you know, individually. Can I make a comment, Urushi? Please, please go ahead. Right. Uh, I, I actually believe if one thing this COVID has taught us is, please grab the moment and take advantage of this. You've got a golden opportunity to decentralize and go back. I'm going to steal this dialogue of uh, Latikesh and I'll quote him. I, pr I promise you I'll quote this. <laughs> the three ways of doing things. One, you give the man fish, you will feed him. You teach him how to fish. And the last, what he really said was very important. He says, Sunil, or people, create the opportunity. They learn themselves. I tell you, I'll give, a, I'll give this example. Maharashtra came to us and said, we need to train two lakh frontline workers. Sunil Anand was the one that said, no way. I, how will the ASHA worker who's got a cell phone or a 
uh, this thing, learn how to use Zoom, etc. And they won't be able to do it. They had the opportunity, and I'll probably say, and I'll eat crow here. One lakh ninety-two thousand Asha workers and Namgarh bodies were on Zoom and trained over ten weeks. Right? People gave them the opportunity. They came up. I don't know how they did it, but they did it. You know, I've got pictures of them in huts sitting together, one individually. So I would say, grab the moment and please take it to the periphery. And I'll end with a with a quote that I, I like. Uh, I read in the Dawn newspaper. He said, "Why must punishment start at the lowest rung of an already lopsided ladder?" I think the poor have had it too bad all along. I think we need to do something for them, and it's our responsibility, the privileged lot, to do that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Anand. I'll, uh, I think it's this has come. This point has come up uh, from all of the panelists that uh, the communication now, the opportunity for communication to go two ways is evident, is very very real. So whether it's decentralized models or whether it is learning sort of what the water usage is from the villages and what actually water usage is. This is, this is where the space for innovation really lies. And there's no more, uh, we can't use the excuse that we don't know what they need anymore. Um, I, just before uh, we move on, uh, if you could just uh, talk a little bit more about this opportunity of telemedicine as uh, Rukmini mentioned, is there, do you have any thoughts on that, on sort of where that would fit in? as an opportunity for livelihoods and villages, that possible? Address to me or Lalitesh? Me, to, to you and then to Lalitesh, that would be great. Lalitesh. Um, okay. yeah. See, I actually we are, we, are a, we are a country of uh, one doctor for every 1800 people, right? We are never going to solve the problem with doctors. And even if we had the money to train 10 times more doctors that is required, it will take us almost a generation to do that. And we don't have the, we don't, we don't want to wait that long. And one of my you know, mentors in the medical area, Dr. Devi Shetty, he has actually shown part of the way. So he has nurses in his hospital who can read cardiograms, right? Uh, something that only people thought doctors can do. And uh, he has nurses which actually implement various parts of the health protocol. And combined with that, there is another uh, movement that is happening. Uh, this is a technology movement, which is the biomarker revolution, right? And what the biomarker revolution means is for what used to cost thousands of rupees to test, it now costs hundreds of rupees, less than five years. And uh, within, uh, you know, within probably at the next three or four years, we will be able to actually have a person go and get a complete ECG and blood oxygen and whatever you actually get in a iron hospital um, at the village level. The cost will come down so much that biomarkers will be ubiquitous. Then at that point, medical uh, diagnosis becomes an issue of care, less an issue of expertise. Now I'm, what I'm saying is anathema, right? This is not something that anybody wants to hear, but I'll repeat that again. It'll become less of an issue of expertise because expertise can be built into software, but care cannot be built into software. So you need that nurse, you need that person who understands the person, who talks to them, measures them, figures out you know, uh, what all is ailing them, and then provides the interface to the various machines we are going to build. And then you know, whenever the diagnosis is clear, and obviously doctors have to verify some of it initially, and some of it will be automated if it can be. But when the care is again required, you know, they have to provide the care, and the care, the best people to provide care is yes, you need nurses and so on, but it is your family, right? This fractal um, was mentioned, one of, one of the speakers, I forgot. You have your family and then the hamlet and then the village and so on, right? This, this is a very, very important construct. So if the care moves down to the level where, you know, you, we are using digital to provide the expertise and the connectivity to the rest of the world, but you actually own uh, the problem and own the solution. I think, that, I think that is the only way we're going to get healthcare to uh, a billion people. And I'll also you know, put, it, put in a plug for system level thinking, right? Even with all the terrible healthcare we have, we have a average lifespan in India of more than 65 years. I don't know the exact numbers, but it is it's quite high, 65 or 68. Um, and there are two things <laughs> that if we could do, not in the health space, would actually have population scale impact on health. Uh, one is, 
uh, having more nutritious food through the PDS, right? We're actually selling poison through the PDS right now. And what used to be, you know, Ayurvedic folk, folk, folklore about 10 years ago is now medically proven. We have papers upon papers of the harmfulness of white rice and, you know, refined oil and sugar and so on. You reverse that, put micronutrients into our food and all kinds of health ailments starts disappearing. And the other one, everybody understands this is sanitation, right? Uh, both are tricky for two different reasons to solve at population scale. But if you actually solve those two, uh, our health will go way up as a society. And, uh, and again, you know, one of them requires, I think, a top-down uh, change. But again, if you think of both of them bottom-up, society knows, people in, in different regions, Karnat people in Karnataka know, for example, that, you know, they, and, and they have cuisines around ragi, right? So they need to be, you need to, you know, sell them ragi through the PDS. And then if you go to certain other state, it will be bajra and so on, right? And similarly, sanitation, um, a letter from top down, a chitti from top down is not the solution. You have to go bottom up saying, hey, sanitation is very, very important. How do you, how do you want us to help you to solve the problem? So I think the inversion and then focusing on the big problems, I think, is one thing we need to do for medical. You muted, Rishi. <laughs> I need to learn this better. Uh, just, uh, I wanted to bring you in because I know you had a point, but thank you for that, Lalitesh. That was, was interesting. I, I, I would agree with Lalitesh. You need to do that, right? Yeah. Uh, India has a lot of resources which we're not using to uh, Nurses, for example. In the United States, nurse assistants treat patients. Yes, they are specialists, but everybody doesn't need specialist care. I talked to a professor at All India Institute. He said 70% of patients coming to All India Institute need not come there. I worked in tertiary care hospitals. There was no OPD there. There was no casualty. It's all downstream. And if we build the skill of nurses, the build the skill of ASHA workers, you got a huge amount of resource available to you. Most of the echo program, when we build capacity, we don't add any extra expense. We don't hire more, tell them to hire more people. We just want to train them. Yes, I agree with that. We cannot train everybody. But the answer to this is to raise the level of the nurses, get them better trained. Why can't they take blood pressure? Why can't they read an ECG, right? You'd be surprised the amount of work that um, uh, the doctors and I mean, non-doctors in the United States and other developing countries do. That's the way to increase care. Technology is an en en enabler. That's my addition to what that the case just added. Sure. Thanks so much for that. And uh, I mean, maybe the Zaitri, if you could come in here in terms of sort of vocational training at a village level, that would be useful. So I think let me go with the two themes that uh, sure. Atikesh uh, set out, you know, uh, and let's just uh, for a minute uh, uh, look at vocations around it, right? Uh, um, uh, so, Latikesh, I'm just going to use uh, the, the case that you uh, built around sanitization, for example. Um, so we've been thinking about this, right? Uh, uh, when when Pizza Hut delivery boy uh, gave pizza in Delhi and was COVID positive, practically everybody in uh, middle class houses panicked, um, saying, you know, what could happen to us? Our health was at issue. Now just imagine um, uh, that uh, uh, we have women in uh, every panchayat and self-help groups have been done on scale in India. Good, bad, they're existing, right? Uh, uh, two women in every panchayat, suppose we're able to use uh, a simple virtual tool to train and have a simple spray can on their back uh, with, uh, with a simple cleaning. Uh, they do cleaning of cows. They do cleaning of areas all the time. All the vehicles which come to the panchayat, the jeeps, the cars, the bikes which come to the main uh, offices there, if we can help them to just sanitize them, take a picture a latitude longitude picture of that and send it back to us. Today we have enough tools at the back to say that this vehicle has been sanitized every day. That means you can clean 20 to 40 vehicles, you can train them within six hours, get an everyday record of how many vehicles are being sanitized uh, uh, with us. A state like Karnataka has 6,000 villages. 6,000 villages, 12,000 women, uh, getting 20 rupees to 40 rupees. That means Narega pays you 260. Narega, one change we need to make. Narega says you have to create assets, you cannot create services. If we make this one change, this woman could earn 6,000 to 8,000 
a behavior pattern that cleaning of a vehicle can be the start of a revolution on sanitization. Vocational education linked to work with a platform philosophy. I'm not saying pay them a salary. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying it is actually like a contract, a contract between a panchayat and two women who are chosen from any of the groups, self-help groups. We have multiple NRLM, uh, uh, WCD groups. If we choose two people and to do this as a profession with a respectable wage, 20 rupees for a two-wheeler, 40 rupees for a four-wheeler and uh, and 35 to 40 vehicles a day. That's all that you require to do. And you're able to reach 6,000 gram panchayats in Karnataka. Now you multiply it, you probably will reach eight, uh, you know, uh, six lakh gram panchayats. And I think it can be a revolution which can be easily brought in. Now let me come to telemedicine. Telemedicine has been always difficult because we like to visit a doctor, right? But it's been changing again because of the COVID uh, uh, this thing now we have 7000 census towns we have 2.5 lakh villages a gram panchayat which have populations less than 5000 now these uh, 2 2 lakh 50000 villages the anm is not going there regularly not able to because of transport where she stays whole lot of issues there now suppose we use again a method by which a telemedicine operator can be just somebody who is a graduate or a 12th pass now this person, like uh, my previous speakers uh, were saying, uh, is, is, uh, is enabled to actually be empathetic. That means take uh, uh, enough of the um, uh, you know, ailments uh, uh, there, not treat. Have the a &M or the phlebotomist come like sales rota. They come twice a week or thrice a week. Formalize that. That means you, have a, you suddenly have an opening to reach uh, 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 at least primary uh, care, you know, which, which can be prevented through telemedicine. Because there's a shortage of doctors, there is a shortage of um, uh, nurses. And here, what you need is, a, in my era, it used to be the STD booth. You need to create a, a similar model, which is simple enough for you to take. I think vocational education to me is the confluence of work and education. At constant points, we have to think of it like this. Uh, today, we're thinking vocational education towards full-time placement, towards jobs. And jobs are not there in 2.5 lakh villages. Jobs are not there in 7,000 uh, census towns, which is why you have 35 to 50 cities where we're all congregating and saying, hey, 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 I want jobs here. Yes, industry is here. But if we have to take it back, these are the essential uh, services that we have to take back and i again uh, i'm saying i just took two examples from from my co-panelists and and said this is the kind of uh, uh, revolution which is possible today given where we are uh Udvashi. thank you so much gayatri uh that was just really useful i think rukmi you have put up your hand theoretically yes i'm a, I'm a good school person so I put up excellent <laughs> Um, I, I want to just take the uh, uh, discussion that Gayatri has uh, 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 started further to say, for example, uh, we have, you know, we had other problems before COVID and we shouldn't forget that. Uh, we have a big nutrition problem in the country. We have a large number of children who uh, are clearly in need of uh, much better nutrition. But at the same time, we have more than a million schools which serve meals every day. Almost all government schools in India, other than urban and a few, have space and have land. And I think that in this, in this, uh, uh, as we look ahead, it is going to be very important to make sure that 250 million children go to school every day. Because apart from all the benefits of being in school and learning and so on, I think it's also a source of uh, nutrition that uh, needs to be strengthened, whether it is Anganwadis or whether it's schools. Now, you know, I don't want to uh, pull the fish argument any further because uh, once I was using this uh, um, uh, statement and some of my friends who are vegetarians said, stop using this fish one. But vegetables, I think, are certainly possible for everyone. I don't see why we cannot have a vegetable garden in every school, which is done both by children in the school as well as by parents or youth, which can serve a very important nutrition need at this time. And 
PDS is one source, but a locally grown, locally organized uh, place where a large part of the today government schools serve the lower end of the distribution. I think with this crisis, with economic uh, hardship in many families, enrollment in government schools is going to go up. And therefore, if you have a nutritious meal that is available, and again, you're building off of already what there is. Uh, second thing is, uh, and again, I, I don't want to keep going back to uh, Lalitesh. Uh, he used the term twice, and I noted it down saying women are sitting at home. I want to tell you that no woman ever sits. I wish more women sat. And certainly those at home have even less time to sit, as you probably realize now that you're at home. But if you notice that midday meals are cooked by women, but in the same village, any dawat, any function, when people gather for weddings or any event, the cooking is done by men. And I think that this is also a great opportunity to do uh, recognition of prior learning or recertification of every midday meal cook in India by raising that status and by enabling, and it's always often a group, of enabling that group to be able to cook even in conditions. So your midday meal cooking is your uh, platform, but you are then enabling people and uh, you know, encouraging them to also be people who can cook for other functions in the village. So I think that this looking at what are the, uh, what are the possibilities at the level of the village where there is already a lot going on, how do you strengthen those, how do you build those, and also use those to build a collective sense that we can solve quite a lot of problems right here. Some things need to happen outside, but there is a lot that can happen right here. Thank you. Uh, Lalitesh, do you want to come in at all on this? Um, yeah, so I apologize for saying the women are sitting because <laughs> I sit for a living. I've been compared to sit and type. I'm a typist by profession. Um, so I think uh, the the point about I think nutrition you know cannot be understated. Um, most of the medical problems we see in the country and may, many of the learning challenges we have is because of lack of good nutrition. And uh, I think the idea of uh, and it's not it's just beyond the school. Right? I think the idea of you know kids growing vegetables um, is a very powerful one. It even schools that don't have land there is every village has uh, land which actually is no man's land owned by the village and that empowerment can happen um, and there are many many cognitive science benefits of you know people growing their vegetables and so on and you learn a lot by doing that you learn the value of time you learn the value of you know teamwork you learn a whole bunch of intangibles by doing that which they don't get because you know they don't have you know the uh, so called upper middle class schools where this experiential learning happens and I think growing stuff is a very, very uh, wonderful way of imparting that. Um, and I think, uh, and I think the other thing that needs to happen is education. I think, uh, uh, I think both the panelists are right. <laughs> Rukmini is right. Education needs to be upended by having people figure out the, not just the teachers and the principals, but let the actual parents and the kids figure out what they want to learn, because they know what they need to learn to make the life work. And at least half of the syllabus can be driven by them. I think that will make a big difference to their lives. Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, we have just about six odd minutes left uh, from this panel. And, uh, you know, there's been so much incredible knowledge shared already. Um, if I could just give all of the panelists, uh, I, I know this is a tough ask, but just a minute to sort of say, in your last words, if you had a completely blank slate and then you were to say, where would we be in 10 years from now? Obviously a very, very tough question because nobody knows where we're going to be in the next week. But uh, with a blank slate, where do you see India in the next 10 years? And I'll let anybody sort of pipe up here. Go first. I started it, so let me start again. Uh, I, I'll repeat what I just said. Please grab the, the opportunity with both hands. The, unfortunately, the situation has given us an opportunity to rethink what we have been doing before. You can't keep doing the same thing and expect better results, right? I think we need to trust the people in the rural areas. Like we need to trust the public, and they will get to learn and find a way out themselves. And in healthcare, I would say, Please retrain your nurses, your ASHA workers, et cetera. We've got a huge pool. And if you upscale their skills, 
I think they'll do a lot more and overcome a lot of the basic disease, prevention, vaccination, etc. if we just change that thinking. That would be my sort of closing remark and I, I hope it's Excellent. done. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Anand. Uh, Gayatri, can we get you to go next? So in 10 years, uh, my feeling is uh, this is going to be the decade of health infrastructure. Uh, you know, um, I believe that the last two decades were one of mobility. Um, so this, uh, this is going to be the health infrastructure decade, which means that all of us will be focusing on everything to do with it. That means, uh, do I have electricity? Do I have water? Because uh, uh, all of us are going to stay home more, whether it's rural or urban. Uh, I'm going to have spaces between, uh, um, you know, where I'm going to be. So, uh, which means that uh, suddenly all these things which were, uh, which we said they didn't have will become more accessible. Um, uh, so in, uh, in 2030, we may, we may actually uh, uh, be solving, uh, you know, this decade is for us to solve these problems. Um, uh, the divide, which digital divide, which existed, uh, needs, to, needs to go if health infrastructure has to be solved. Uh, if health infrastructure has to be solved, then uh, I need access to uh, trained professionals, uh, uh, medicine, education, uh, and health infrastructure. So mobility brought me economic growth. So villages grew on the back of remittances. Uh, cities grew on the back, states grew on the back of remittances. Uh, whether it was outside or now, now I think it will have to be growing on, not on the back of remittances, but on the back of uh, self-sufficiency. But self-sufficiency will have to be redefined. Um, you know, it, it's not about going back into a shell but it is about uh, having it in a manner in which it is more equitable. I think that's where I feel the change will be. Fair enough. Thank you so much for that, Gayatri. Uh, Lalitesh, maybe I can bring you in now? Sure. Um, even independent of the current crisis, um, mm -hmm. we were at a fulcrum, at a fourth sure. in our history. Um, the digital era, which can be the source of many solutions, is also the source of problems. Um, if, if we are not cognizant, um, it will wipe out our jobs and we won't have anything to replace it, right? And uh, the interesting thing is, if you look closely at all the discussions we've been having, we are discussing after 70 years after independence, we are discussing freedom. We've been discussing freedom of our communities, of our businesses, and of our, you know, uh, families to choose and to decide uh, and design our lives. Right? Um, we have it, and the I mean, the people on this panel have it because of uh, education and the luxury we live in, and so on. But the average person does not have freedom. Right? All the choices are made for them, and um, and this is not going to happen organically. Um, the conclusion I'm fast coming to is people have to engage, um, and it and it also, I I hope it does not require a revolution of the kind that led to our independence. I think the answer might be somewhere in between. We are a democracy, and if the people demand loudly enough, they will get what they need, and we have to figure out how they are going to have the voice to demand loudly enough, because status quo is our big businesses are going to suffer, the small and micro businesses are going to suffer, and we are. As a collective, we are going to continue to be 2% of the world's economy. We were 4% at independence, right? Um, and, and that has to be appended. Um, and technology can have a very powerful role to play in bringing the voice of the people out and letting them co-create their own solutions. Um, but only if uh, you know, we give ourselves the freedom to. And, uh, and this is not a complaint. I'm not saying the government is at fault and so on. I think we have to also remember uh, Gandhiji's words, which is that you can put me in prison, but I can be free, right? So I think we have to assume freedom and make it work. And I think that's the only way we'll become a thriving economy in 10 years. Thank you so much for that. Yes. Rukmini, um, last words. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not a solution. It's not a vision, but maybe uh, something to think about. Uh, I think uh, we were just talking earlier that every age group in India is 25 million, roughly. So imagine and focus on the 25 million who are in standard eight today 
or who are going to go into standard eight once the school year opens. This uh, standard eight, 10 years ago, only 12 million or 11 million children make it. So in the last 10 years, there's been a huge increase in opportunity for children to stay on in school. But the interesting thing is that if you look at actual learning levels, this uh, 25 million has exactly the same learning levels that it did 10 years ago. So I think that we need to look forward as to where this 25 million is going to be when they are 25 years old. Today they are 14 or 15. And they are going to need a whole set of different uh, ways to cope with the world. I'm not even calling it skills. They're going to know, they're going to need to know how to work together in smaller groups. They are going to need to know how to solve problems. Today, they're only 14 or 15, so they may be problems right in their village. They are going to need the confidence to say that I don't have money and there's going to be even less perhaps resources available either in their families or in their schools. But I, as a group of uh, young people in the village, know how to solve at least one problem and then build from that onwards. So I think that one of the first things we should do when schools open is to ask the eight standard kids, where are you today? What have you learned in the last few months? And where do you think together you're going to be 25 years from now? And go and ask all the adults to help you to get there. Thank you so much for that. That is uh, absolutely fantastic. And, um, you know, I think uh, as a moderator, I, I, I don't know who decided, but uh, we, you know, the, I have the envious task of trying to uh, summarize this, but I will leave with uh, just the one thought that has sort of spread, uh, has been the thread throughout this conversation is that uh, the, the divide between the open space for innovation is really between rural and urban. And that has come through from all of your uh, thoughts and sort of knowledge that you have shared with us. Um, and it, it, I think rural was always something that was for us in the urban world, somebody else's problem. But uh, that gap has sort of narrowed a lot given this crisis. And the space for innovation really lies within that. Um, obviously, there was uh, a lot of great thoughts around technology, broadband, uh, the government's role. Um, and uh, we, you know, it would be, I think the call for action, uh, the, the specific recommendations from this panel, it would be great if we could find a way to actually uh, take action on that. Uh, I think with Charcha, the, the idea was really for us as a sector to come together and have this conversation, but uh, conversations without action lead to nothing. So let, let's see if we can put our heads together to do something about that. And uh, I think the three words that I really circled throughout this conversation was trust, freedom, and communication as being sort of the pillars on all of this. So uh, with that, thank you all for all of your time and knowledge and sharing. And um, you know, it's 6.33 and I wanted to thank also the audience for their patience in staying with us. And I know we've been streamed on multiple different platforms. So I hope everyone has learned from this and uh, I'll let Priya say the final words on this. So thank you so much. Thank you so much everybody for uh, spending the time with us and thank you to all the panelists. I know that we've had multiple conversations around it, but it was great to listen to your thoughts and, uh, and get some very interesting quotes from you. Uh, I think decentralized was a word that came in by a lot of people. I absolutely, I think it's a good idea for us to start thinking about what can we do in the rural areas? How can we give more power to rural communities? Um, uh, Thank you for joining us today. Um, uh, the objective of this session was to give inspiration to people who want to build um, for Bharat, uh, build for future, to think about what are areas that they should focus on. So this was absolutely the right panel to, uh, to gather together. Uh, we have um, uh, further attendees. We will pick up again tomorrow morning. Uh, that all these ideas that came in today require a lot of different types of enablers to come in place. And that is what we will focus on tomorrow. Uh, what are different types of enablers that need to be there um, for us to achieve the dream that everybody is thinking of now? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.